Now in this class, we're going to focus upon the wildflowers found in coastal areas. And this is part of the Helping Hands for Butterflies project, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Nature Scott. And in Scotland, we have around 6,000 miles of coastline on the mainland alone. And if you include the islands, that's over 11,500 miles of coast. And the east and west of Scotland differ greatly in their climate and their geology. The west coast is heavily indented and rocky, whereas the east is more regular with long sandy beaches and estuaries. And this can be reflected in the plant and butterfly species, with some species absent from the west coast but abundant in the east and vice versa. And within coastal areas we have many different habitats. We have things like gravel beaches which tend to be less rich in wildflowers but can also have some species requiring those extreme conditions. And we also have cliffs which can be really important for things like nesting birds as well as being refuges for wildflowers and insects as they're relatively inaccessible to grazing animals like sheep and cattle. Then we have sand dunes. Now in Scotland relatively few of these are now intact but they're still really important habitats. And we also have macar. So macar is a unique habitat only found in parts of northwest Scotland and Ireland and it's a kind of flower rich grassland that is managed by appropriate grazing. It's now home to some of the rarest species we have in Scotland, including the great yellow bumblebee, the Scottish primrose, Irish ladies tresses and wading birds like lapwings. So macar is a fantastic habitat to have. And we also have salt marshes, which are flat areas where the vegetation is regularly inundated by salt water. So it's home to some unique plants and animals which favour those conditions. And a good example of that, of that is the Solway Firth. And just looking at the wildflowers then, we'll start off with the pea family and kidney vetch. So kidney vetch has masses of yellow flowers which are surrounded by white woolly hairs. And it has long leaves with curled up sides. And we can look at that in the closer photograph here. You can see these masses of flowers at the end of these really stout stalks and also a fringe of leaves around the flowers themselves. Then if you look at the leaves, you can see that they're curled up all at the sides. It's only found in coastal areas or chalk grassland, usually in very rocky places. And it's the caterpillar food plant of the small blue butterfly. Now, small blue is the UK's smallest uh, butterfly species and there are a few sites for it in Scotland, most of which are coastal, though there are a few inland, especially in the Cairngorms and in Angus. And this is how the small blue looks. So on the upper wings it's mostly a, a dull dark blue colour with a few blue scales, but the undersides are a pale grey colour with these black spots. The caterpillars of this only feed on kidney vetch and they fly for about one month from the end of May in Scotland. Now into red clover, so this isn't only a coastal plant and many of the plants we'll be dealing with today aren't exclusively coastal, but they are important parts of coastal habitats. For example, red clover is an important part of the macar habitat and it's very widespread throughout Scotland and you'll find it in meadows and verges and other grassy places. And it's really, it's really easy to identify because it's the only widespread pinky red clover, as you can see here from the flowers all packed together. And the only other clover which you're likely to find is called zigzag clover, but it's very similar, but it's much, much less common. And if you see a plant like this, chances are it will be red clover. And you can also sometimes notice that it has these paler green V-shaped marks upon the leaves. And it's a really good source of nectar for butterflies and a vital source of pollen for bumblebees because it contains higher amino acids than other types of plants. So it's full of proteins, which is really good for raising the young bees within the nest. Staying with the pea family then, again another one which is, isn't only found in coastal areas, it's called bird's foot trefoil and this is a common plant found in various open sunny and dry habitats and you'll find it in, in meadows, uh, uplands, road verges and brown fields, so some of our derelict sites, so it really likes those open really dry spaces. And has groups of yellow flowers at the ends of the stems as you can see in the photograph here. And it's very low growing, usually only to 40 centimetres and usually much less. So this is a plant which can't really scramble up over other plants and therefore it requires uh, the grass and other vegetation to be less vigorous in order for it to get some light. So the word trefoil in the name refers to the groups of three leaves, which you can see in the photo here. 
And the name bird's foot then refers to the shape of the seed pods. And if you look in the photograph as well, so the, so the seed pods are all here and they are very similar to the foot of a bird. The most similar plant to this would be greater bird's foot trefoil, which does grow taller and it does scramble over other plants, but it tends to be found in damp places. Bird's foot trefoil is great because it's the caterpillar food plant for the common blue butterfly, which is the only widespread blue butterfly we have in Scotland. And it's also the caterpillar plant of the six spot burnet moth, which you can see here. This moth has a mostly black wings, but you can see these striking red dots, which can warn predators that it's poisonous. Now another plant then, which is a really good source of nectar for insects, is a plant called thrift. You find it almost exclusively in coastal areas, but it seems to be moving more inland due to the salting of roads. So thrift is distinctive because it has these globular heads of pink flowers on really strong stalks, and they'll be good for withstanding the wind in the coastal areas. And you can see these bright pink flowers just here. There aren't any other plants like it. It can grow up to 30 centimetres tall, but it's usually much shorter in exposed coastal areas. And the leaves then are grass-like, so they're long and thin, and they look just like grass. It flowers from April to July, and is a good source of nectar for insects in these places. It's the only thrift species in Scotland, and nothing else looks like it, so it's very difficult to confuse it with anything else. Now we're on to the carrot family then, and we'll start with wild carrot. And so this plant, the, this, the wild carrot is actually typical of that group of plants with an umbrella of flowers at the top of the stem. So it looks like an upturned umbrella. You can see the stem here with the flowers all coming out, radiating from the top of it, which is quite distinctive of that family. It can be really difficult to separate the members of the carrot family. So there are a few things you can look for with the wild carrot. First of all, you have these fine leaves surrounding just underneath the flower head. It has parsley like lower leaves. And there's often a single purple flower right in the center of the flower head. You can't see it in the photos, but you can see it in the illustration here. So look in the center and you might see a single purple flower there. Then whenever the flowers have finished opening and they've, they've bloomed and uh, they, they've gone over, you'll see that it actually forms an urn shape formation at the top. So the, the flower formation just uh, goes upwards and it looks like this urn shape. And that's another distinctive thing about the wild carrot. And it flowers from June to August and is another good source of nectar and pollen for insects. Now this plant, Viper's bugloss, um, isn't strictly a coastal plant, but it prefers open, dry habitats and some disturbance. So you might find it on some hill habitat where there might be a lot of walking, for example, or some disturbance from rock falls. So it really needs disturbed habitats like that. It belongs in the same plant family as borage and forget-me-nots. And it's quite distinctive and you're very unlikely to confuse it with any other plant because it has these strong blue flowers with purple parts at the front. You can see the purple petals here, sorry, the blue flowers here and the purple reproductive parts of the flowers coming out here. And it has the old flowers are contained just behind the new flowers. And, and so the, the whole thing then begins to droop over. So it has a very straggly appearance. It's very hairy all over and quite prickly and it grows to about 30 centimeters tall. Now we'll start looking at some of the really tall plants which are quite distinctive that you can find in coastal areas. Some of these aren't native to the UK but they are now naturalized and a good example of that is weld. So again it's not only a coastal plant you can find it inland in disturbed ground or derelict sites but it's quite distinctive because of its overall appearance. It's very tall being up to one and a half meters tall with these very thin spikes of flowers, as you can see in the photo here, the whole way up, the flowers are very small, but they're contained on these very long spikes. And the individual flowers then themselves are only about five millimeters across and they're fairly insignificant. And it has long leaves with wavy margins. And you can see that in the photograph here, you can see the shadow there where it's quite waved. And this plant used to be grown for its use as a yellow dye, which might explain how it's so widespread because it might've been cultivated for use in dyes. Another very tall plant then is Great Mullen. So this is sometimes better known by its genus name, which is Verbascum. And there are many of these which are found in gardens, but this is the most widespread one found in the wild in Scotland. It is mostly coastal, but again, can be found in rocky disturbed places like waste ground. 
And it's a biennial plant, meaning that it only lives for two years. And sites can have a mix of flowering and non-flowering plants. So any of those, um, those large rosettes of the plants at the bottom, which haven't bloomed one year, should bloom the following year. And after that, they will die. It's one of several million species which can be found in the UK, but this is by far the most widespread one in Scotland. And it's distinctive by having really large leaves, which are very thick, um, and they're covered in dense hairs. And then you have these flower stalks with uh, yellow, bright yellow flowers on them with uh, orange stamens in the middle. And another tall plant growing up to one and a half meters tall is mugwort. And this is again, mostly coastal in Scotland with quite a distinctive appearance. It has these many woody stems coming out from the base with small flowers contained towards the top. And it has these really ragged leaves which have no hairs on the upper surface, but which has fine silvery hairs on the under surface. And you can see those two colors here. The upper surface will be darker and the lower surface will be brighter with these really fine silvery hairs on the undersides. The flowers are very small, but they're very numerous. So these are the flowers here. Um, and there are many of those per plant. There are other similar species, including wormwood, sea wormwood, and hoary mugwort, but all of those are much less common. So now we're on to sea campion, and this is a representative of the same plant family as red campion and ragged robin. So as the name suggests, sea campion is almost entirely coastal in Scotland, but you can find it in some alpine areas. It's very low growing, forming a cushion of leaves over which these flowers are held. And the flowers are quite big, so they're relatively large. They're two and a half centimetres across and bloom from June until August. And they're an important source of nectar and pollen for insects. And overall, it's quite a distinctive plant by having most of its leaves contained in these cushions with the flowers held above them with these large bladders just behind the petals of the flowers. Now, sticking with the campions, then we do have a couple more to look at. First of all, we look at white campion. Overall, this is quite a hairy plant, which is important for helping you to separate it from other plants. So you can see here the hairs on the calyx, which is the bit just behind the main petal of the flowers. It grows up to one meter tall, but usually much less, and has these large white flowers growing up to three centimeters in diameter. And you can look again here, you can see that the calyx tube is quite hairy. And it flowers from May until September. And plants like this are really important sources of food for butterflies and moths because the flowers are so deep. The, the butterflies and moths can get inside with their proboscises to get nectar out. And many of the plants which flower at nighttime are more attractive to moths because it's easier to see lighter colors at nighttime. Then there's also bladder campion, which is quite similar, but this is a mostly hairless plant. The flowers are slightly smaller, only growing up to 1.5 centimeters, and the calyx tube is hairless and inflated like a bladder. So you can see just here, if you compare the, the calyx tubes, they're completely uh, quite, quite different, and this one is quite inflated. So this is why it gets its name of bladder campion. And it flowers from June until August, and again is another important nectar source for insects. Now we're on to the daisy family. So we can look at sea mayweed, which again is mostly coastal in Scotland, though inland in some locations. And it can be very easily confused with other similar species, such as the chamomiles and other mayweeds. So what you're looking for with the um, sea mayweed are the fact that the plants form these dense mats with horizontal stems going across the ground, whereas many other uh, members of that family, which look similar, usually grow straight upwards. The flowers are quite large, up to two centimeters across, with white outer petals and yellow inner florets. And if you look at the leaves then, they're relatively succulent, as many of the plants found in coastal areas are. So coltsfoot then is another plant which isn't only coastal, but is very likely to be encountered at coastal sites, such as sand dunes. And it's also found in areas of short grass, road verges and disturbed ground. And they flower really early in the year, usually in March and April. And the flowers are contained on stalks, which are covered in scales that appear well before the leaves. So these flowers come up on their own and the leaves come up later. And you can see from the illustration here, it has these scales all the way up the stem with these bright yellow flowers at the top of those. 
The leaves, whenever they do appear, are quite large and they are hoof shaped, hence the name colt's foot. And you can see it from the illustration here, the shape of the, the leaves. This is a really important of early nectar and pollen for insects whenever they emerge early in the year. Staying with the daisy family, these might not look so much like daisies, but they actually are within that family. And we'll start with yarrow. So this is a very widespread plant of dry soils and disturbed places, including coasts. You'll find that it has flat heads of white flowers, which are very close together. If you look closely then, the flowers do have a creamy colored center. And it has fern-like leaves, so very feathery, ferny-like leaves, and these stalks, which contain the flowers at the end. And it flowers from June until September. And plants like this with very small flowers are quite important for some of the smaller insects and even some of the smaller butterflies, including the small copper. Now, sneezewort is in the same family as yarrow, and it has individual flowers which are larger than yarrow, though, and they're less densely packed. So if you compare the two photographs there, you'll see that sneezeweed uh, flowers are, are much bigger and they're further apart from one another. They're not contained in a head like that of yarrow. The leaves are lanceolate, so they're not fern-like as they are in yarrow. And this plant prefers wetter habitats, whereas yarrow is mostly found in drier habitats. And it flowers from June until August. And if you're around yarrow in the summertime, you might see the yarrow plume moth. This is a species which flies in June and July and mostly just hangs around yarrow, which it lays its eggs upon. And the plume moths generally tend to have a very unusual appearance where you can see that the wings are actually furled up like this. So they look, whenever they're at rest, they look uh, just like a straight line going across. But whenever they are in flight, the wings unfurl, so they look much bigger. So that's the yarrow plume moth and one to keep an eye on. Now we're on to silverweed, which isn't strictly a coastal plant again, but again, likely to be found in things like sand dunes. And it's also found in disturbed places such as farm tracks, roadsides and waste ground. And it's very easily identified by the brightly silvery leaves covered in fine hairs, which is how it gets its name. So you can see here the leaves, for a start, they're quite ragged at the edges, almost like a serrated edge. And it's got these long silver hairs. And whenever it's a sunny day, this plant really does shine in the sun. And if, if, if you find it in flower, you'll see that it has five petaled yellow flowers, which come out from June until August. and it spreads by runners on the ground. Now with ladies bed straw, again, this isn't only a coastal plant, you'll find it in various dry grasslands and road verges and upland meadows. And it's quite distinctive though, because it has dense sprays of tiny bright yellow flowers. Now there are other bed straws, most of which have white flowers, but ladies bed straw is quite distinctive by having these yellow flowers. You'll see that before they emerge, you'll see them coming up through the meadow. Here it is with red clover and yellow rattle and various grasses. These are before the flowers open. And then when it does open, you'll see this really large spray of yellow flowers. The flowers then have four petals and you can see many hundreds of them packed in to a small area here. And the leaves then are very fine and they are dark green. And you can see here on the illustration, they have these whorls going up the stem and with very fine dark green leaves. Now within the brassica family we have sea rocket um, and you can tell that family quite easily because it has four petals. The flowers are a white uh, or pale lilac and it's very frequently found on beaches and is only known from coastal areas in Scotland. Sometimes you just find plants on their own in the middle of a beach where it seems like there's very little soil underneath and it can do that because it has very succulent leaves which retain moisture. It is a, a caterpillar food plant for small white butterflies and white butterflies generally lay their eggs upon plants within the brassica family. Now, if you look at just one of the butterflies, which tends to be mostly coastal in Scotland, uh, we have the grayling butterfly. And as you can see from the map, most of its sites are around the coasts. There are a few inland, especially if it can find uh, quarries or disturbed places like that. So even though its caterpillar food plants are found in many places, it lays its eggs upon fine leaved fescue grasses. This butterfly seems to be mostly be only found around coastal areas. That's because they need sunny, open and warm conditions with lots of bare ground, which can be 
can be provided in these coastal sites. And as you can see, the caterpillars are really well camouflaged against the fine leaved grasses there. But our coastal areas are under threat for various reasons. Some of these are really important though, because they're the last refuges of plants and animals, as so much of the rest of the landscape has become unsuitable due to agriculture. And many of them now are being threatened by things such as golf courses, especially in the past, but that is still an ongoing issue with some sand dune habitats being threatened by having golf courses built upon them. But climate change could bring further problems, especially with greater erosion to dunes. There might be more powerful storms and rising sea levels, which really could affect some of these delicate coastal habitats. In other areas then, they're also threatened by invasive species such as sea buckthorn. And sea buckthorn uh, can really invade some of these coastal sites and it can very easily shelter out all of the light and prevent that getting to the lower growing wildflowers and can very quickly become a big problem. Other sites then are threatened by natural encroachment of native tree and shrub species. So they might need managed through appropriate grazing uh, to keep them open and to prevent these trees and shrubs taking over them. One of the most important species in our coastal areas is the new forest burnet moth, a species which is now only found on a single grassy slope on the Arden American Peninsula. So this site needs protection from sheep grazing, so it requires a fence. But at the same time, the absence of grazing might also reduce the numbers of caterpillar food plants. So we need to find balance where there is some grazing, but not too much in order to help this very rare moth. And we're very, going to very great lengths to conserve it. And here's a photograph of a helicopter bringing in the fencing materials because that was the only way to get these materials to this very remote site. And to help species such as these, we have a new project as a partnership project with Nature Scott and Rethink Nature and many other partners. Um, and it's called Species on the Edge. And the idea behind it is to conserve all of many of our coastal species, which really are a threat of extinction, including the small blue, northern brown argus, marsh fritillary, and some of the rare burnet moths. So thank you for listening to that presentation. Hopefully you learned something about coastal wildflowers and check out the rest of the presentations to learn about wildflowers from other locations.